Well, now for the moment you've all been waiting for, it's my, uh, my privilege and my thrill to introduce you to our speaker today. Um, Ron has spoken once before for us a couple of years ago, uh, even though he came here not expecting to speak. But uh, we have found that Ron is one of those guys that's already, always ready to give an answer for the hope that he has within. He's a former Olympian, a former uh, Olympic shot putter. He's running uh, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for the state of Minnesota. His uh, wife is from Ladysmith. His mother-in-law is from Duran, so he's got some local roots, so we're not going to hassle him about the Vikings or the Gophers or anything like that. We're going to treat him nice. Treat him right and give him a warm welcome, Ron Backus. It is a pleasure to be here. And uh, if this gives us too much trouble, I'm just going to ditch it and speak really loud. Uh, but either way, we're going to be all right. Uh, I just want to, if you don't mind, can I just pray? Can I just pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the privilege just to be alive today to enjoy all that you've given us. It, um, there are challenges, and life is not easy, and you said that, you actually said Life is not going to be easy. And, um, but you have overcome the world. You have, you may not help us, uh, you may not get us out of challenges, but you'll help us through it. And I am a testament to that, Lord. I uh, thank you for the, the awesome food. Bless the hands that prepared it. Um, and just uh, pray your Holy Spirit would just be with us today, that I might honor you and uh, that it make you known. And thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, I work for Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and the one thing I did want to talk about with FCA, um, FCA has been around for 60 years, and one of the things that we discovered is the impact, or discovered and realized, and always known the impact and influence of a coach. Uh, coaches. Today, research would tell you that coaches are the most influential, um, authoritative adult in, a, in an adolescent's life who participates in sports. More than parents, more than um, teachers, more than uh, people of faith and, 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 and the ministry, it's the coach that has the influence. And it's been said, two most powerful words in English language are coach says. FCA has um, shifted its focus in the last few years. And for many years, FCA has, uh, has always had the coach involved, that we administered through coaches. But in the last few years, we've realized that in today's culture, uh, especially the sports culture, which is so much has gotten down to this idea of win at all costs, that the coaches, the challenge in a coach's life to coach this 21st century athlete in this culture is greater, the pressure and, and the difficulty in coaching is greater than it's ever been before. Uh, because the culture's changed and it's impacted the, this generation. And um, so there's big challenges. So what we've made a commitment in the last few years is that we need to not just minister through coaches, but we need to minister to coaches. And without an agenda, we need to minister to coaches, period. And then when they're ready, through coaches, because like I said, the culture of sport is broken, it's all win at all costs. And so this opportunity that we have to reach out to coaches who are the most influential people uh, in an adolescent's life today is, is a powerful platform uh, for, for ministry to kids. And their coaching in and of itself is the vehicle they have to reach kids and reach their hearts. What I want to do is just show you a couple quick uh, promo videos uh, that kind of give you an overview. And when I'm done, I'm going to introduce you to our local FCA representative here in the area. So I just uh, hope this, this works. The two most powerful words in the English language are coach says. You know, there's a saying that sport teaches life skills. Sport does not teach life skills. Sport is a great vehicle by which life skills can be taught, but that can only be done through this person called coach. The problem is we are more enamored by greatness than we are by goodness. Coaches feel this pressure to transact with kids. You perform for me, I'll give you what you want. If we can help coaches understand their purpose in coaching, 
Now they no longer have to transact with kids, but they can be deliberate about being transformational in their lives all by how they coach them. It's important to me to watch what I'm doing and to watch the reflection that I'm putting out in front of my athletes. If I'm not being a true role model, then I can't ask for that of them, and I can't ask them to be role models for others. We need to be more mindful of where our student athletes are at. That's where FC really comes into play. We have a passion and desire to be able to coach the coach through our three-dimensional coaching and, and just really come alongside the coach and encourage him and challenge him in his own personal walk through biblical principles. So what we've looked at in the research and what we've looked at in the teachings of Christ is what would it look like to motivate someone from the inside out? What if it came from within me to coach somebody in all dimensions of their being, their body, their mind, and their spirit? All coaches have to coach in the first dimension, the first dimension being physical. And we've identified areas that coaches got to be great in, no matter what sport you should coach. The issue is most coaches stop there. But athletes today come to the coach with a whole lot of different issues. So a coach now has to coach in a higher level if he's going to be a higher producing athlete. That introduces the second dimension. And the second dimension now is a, a coach has to step into the life of the athlete. Kids are being exposed to sports at a much younger age now. I think it's been preached to them that it's about winning and losing for a long time. The joy of it, the fun of it has been lost on them. If we're coaching the body, the physical aspects, dealing with the mind, the connection with you and others, we eventually have to get to the spirit. That part of our being that determines our value, our worth, our identity, our character, our significance. That's why we tell coaches it's now essential to learn how to coach the heart of the player, not just the skills and strategy of the game. Because if kids enter into an environment where they're cared for, they're not about to leave that. That's life-giving, and sport needs to be life-giving, not life-draining. So what we do is we come up with coaching strategies, strategies. Here's some things you might do off the field. Here's some things you can do during practice that actually allows the athletes to see what it would mean to play sport from within themselves in a relationship with others. We want to help coaches identify their transformational purpose in coaching, their why behind the X's and O's. If we can help a coach understand his or her higher purpose in coaching, now that can act as a filter for every interaction and activity that takes place within the program. We have seen unbelievable results as we continue to be able to challenge coaches to be able to connect with who they are in Christ because then once they realize who they are in Christ, then out of the overflow, they begin to reach that third dimension. Take advantage of the resources that FCA provides and allow God to do a work in you that will transform your team in an unbelievable way. So I originally thought that my purpose was to make a better athlete, to make a better cheerleader, to make a better runner, but that's not my purpose. My purpose is to help them improve their life skills as a coach through athletics and through their passion for the sport. To neglect one aspect is by definition to not be the best you can be. That's why we develop these resources, to coach somebody in all dimensions of their being. Just gotta make a quick switch here. What I want to do is show you an example of a coach who embraced this idea of coaching as a platform, as a vehicle, uh, to fulfill a higher purpose in his life. And it's what we would call our transformational coaching purpose. And so I'm just going to let the video speak for itself. And I just want you to think about one thing. Would you want your son or daughter to play and compete for a coach like this? It was just what we coaches know as a very bad practice. And I oh. snapped. I lost it. I don't know what I said. All I remember is screaming, throwing a fit, and telling my team to go get a drink. Take a break. At that point, I remember thinking I'm about to have a heart attack. And I stood with an FCA staff member, Drew Beard, and he told me about three-dimensional coaching. And I remember standing there just thinking about all the things that that could give to not just a program, but to a community, to a staff. As he began to see that, and as he began to have success with that, he realized that this platform was something that's big. As he had the success he had at Nixon, he got a call, and uh, lo and behold, uh, he ended up being here in Alpha, Oklahoma. It's like, I mean, it was a community experience. The odds were definitely against him. He had heard 
in a program that was not very good. Uh, it had been down for several years. We kind of been the team everybody pushed around. They won a total of eight games from their seventh grade year to their junior year. It had been a, a, a drought. Uh, it had not rained in almost five years, so we were really down as a, as a team, as a football team, as a community. What's that out? Draw you there, and he just had that response every time. God's doing something there, and I think he wants to be a part of it. Jerry Reed had what I consider a vision. We're going to do the first dimension things and be great at our X's and O's, our tactics, and, and the schemes that we put out. But we're going to be very intentional about the second dimension of how to incorporate team cohesion, how to get the most out of kids through different ways of motivation. Our goal is to be that third dimension to show that it's more than just about sport, that it's about caring for somebody as a person first and as a player second. This coaching staff came in. They they praised the kids and they they brought a whole new mindset. There is gonna be times we're coaching hard, but we're gonna love them. We're gonna we're gonna think about their life. I didn't really buy into it until I see exactly how it molded us together on the field. Something was changing inside the locker room and with the relationship between the coaches and athletes. Before, they played out of fear. They played, played out of, uh, I'll get punished if I don't do this correctly. We went and took our, our most skilled kids and pulled them to the side and said, we want you to go teach your other teammates. It's going to be awkward. I don't know this kid. And, you know, he's, he's young. We're not going to be on the same type of levels. But then you get to connect with him, and uh, you see a little bit of yourself in them. The ability to go and, and teach something that they have been taught, the pride that it gave them. When I bought into it and actually saw what it could do, it, it changed my life. It really did. It changed my life as a whole. We were just together all the time. It was fun. And there was no arguing in the locker room. And the kids were starting to buy into the, to the early bit of the angle. Once another coach's house was so like another, like another home outside of our own homes. Once or twice a week, we go uh, eat at our position coach's house. It was just a way for us to make a rock. He's touched those kids' hearts in a way that they trust him. And to watch this transformation, it was it would make the hair stand up on the back of their neck. As I coach a lot of freshmen kids now, when he's talking about what's happening on the field, I notice that Betsy and I's conversations about our kids or our athletes change. We were talking about kids who were struggling, or kids who needed to be lifted up a little bit. And I've seen these kids develop so much quicker. They work so much harder now. You know, our discipline problems, and there just be a number of complaints. Those issues really were diminished. When they started to connect with who these kids were and what they were trying to accomplish, our community really fell in love with this team. I, I've never seen that in, in this community before, of our community to come together to support our students. That first game, I knew it was going to be a great season. We have a great turnout from the community. It brought the whole community together as one. The Mets continued to grow through the rest of the season. We knew we had something special, it's something that could really, you know, flip the town upside down, and that's basically what happened. It was a constant story, running story throughout the year. There was dynamics to it, constant. Somebody named Shaman, and another kid named Shaman next to me. Not like the author against us, they were making fighting. You know, it was just that will to win that he developed in our kids. I had never seen a coaching staff bond together in the way that that coaching staff was done. And then the day of the championship, the coach is kind of, our field goal kicker walks up. He kicks the game winning field goal to win the game. They call a timeout right as he kicks the ball. You kick that field goal to win, and even though you hit it, it didn't count. He goes back out on the field, and we, right before he kicks the ball, he turns to Coach Reed, and Coach Reed looks at him and says, no matter whether you hit this or not, I'm still going to love you, and you're an amazing kid. And he goes, I got this, Coach Reed. He walks out, kicks 40 yard field goal, and it's a good game. It wasn't a wild moment. It wasn't a slow motion moment. It become more about the daily victories that we had the season victories and not just the state championship. These kids have got leadership skills and they're even far beyond the football fields on Friday nights. Not only did we survive a physical drought, we survived 
So the question on the table is, would you want your kids to play for a coach like that? I think we all would. Um, there's a terminology we use in FCA called transformational coach or transactional coach. And I think inherently when I talk about being a transformational coach or a transactional coach, you kind of know what that means. So in your estimation, how many of you, the majority of coaches that you had were transactional only? Just wins and losses and it was just about the game. How many of you had transformational coaches that actually invested you and motivated out of love, not fear? A, a few hands. See, what FCA's passion is to help coaches who are Christians become Christian coaches, to help coaches move from being transactional to transformational. Because there's only so much time they have in front of these kids. I mean, they're, they're, getting, so, they're getting pulled in so many directions. There's just a moment of time every day that they can pour into these kids. And it's amazing. And what I want to do at this point, I want to introduce uh, Andrew Draper. Andrew, why don't you stand up? He's our local FCA representative here in the central Wisconsin, was it, is it central Wisconsin? Northwest. I'm sorry, northwest Wisconsin area. So this is Andrew. Andrew, how long have you been on staff? I've been on staff for eight years, and you saw Mark Hull in that first video. I'm sure he's, he's been here a number of times. I am now transitioning into Mark's role as the area director. He's still around, but now he's all over the world. So now I'm, I'm moving to the area director as our ministry transitions to coaches. I'm transitioning at the same time into that role as I've been around working with the high schools and middle schools and even college kids for, for the last seven or eight years. Awesome. Thank you very much. And there's uh, other staff in the area that... So if you want to connect with uh, Andrew and learn more about FCA, uh, do that after we're done here. There's other staff in the area. And here's what the cool process is. You heard us talk about coaches discovering their transformational coaching purpose. We help them do that by learning how to live out their faith as a coach in the rest of their life. Once they define that, then we help them create a plan to fulfill that. Sometimes FCA, that, that's with FCA, because FCA has great tools that coaches, opportunities like our, our school-based huddles or our camps. Bob Lickie here has been, you've worked FCA camp for how many years? 25. How many years you coached? 43. And, and Bob has just imp impact and influenced so many kids all around the state. And he's, you know, all the, he's eight years old. And, uh, and he's, you know, he still sees him fulfilling his, God's given him a purpose as a coach, and he's not stopping. By the way, if anybody's looking for a football coach, I think he's, uh, he's for hire right now. Is that what I understand? So he, he is going where God leads him. And I, and I appreciate Bob. And, and I'm sorry, I think uh, Dallas, you were with, you've also I've been a huddle leader. I was been a huddle leader for many years at what high school? It was at Mondovi High School. Mondovi High School. So FCA has been a big part of their lives, and, and they have uh, impacted lots of kids. See, the thing that we're talking about here is the win-at-all-cost culture. And what's interesting is that has a lot to do with my own story. I grew up in a small town in central Minnesota, and I'm the youngest of six kids. I had uh, four older brothers that were phenomenal in sports. And, and that set the tone for me. And the thing was interesting, it was, it was solidified in my mind, uh, we had what we called our rec room. I don't know if any of you have a, uh, have a room in your house that's kind of where everybody gathers. And our rec room was interesting, it was, uh, we had like a tuck under, walk-in type basement, and you walked in and there was a long, narrow room. And right when you walked in the room, there was a couch on the right, and then my favorite thing, there was an indoor charcoal barbecue pit. I mean, it was awesome. I mean, it was. It had a. It had direct vented. There was a, a, a electric uh, spigot that would turn. Like you knew something was happening if there was a party going on and we were cooking on it. You could smell through the house. And whether it was a roast, a chicken, or a cat or something, we were. It was awesome. And uh, I don't know why I said that. Uh, and so, on the left, when you walked in, was a big piece of furniture called the entertainment center and it was an LP record player and an 8-track tape player. 
Some of you may or may not know what that is, depending on your age. And, uh, and they go a little further on the left, we had a, a well-stocked bar, uh, and then right next to it was the gun cabinet, which I always thought was interesting, you have the alcohol and the ammunition handy, within reach, you know. So it was always lively and it was a well-protected house. So, and then, um, then we had a pool table, but the centerpiece of the room, up on the wall was a huge trophy case. I mean, literally, I think it was about 10 or 12 feet long, and all my brothers being successful, it was packed with ribbons and trophies and, and, and all kinds of accomplishments that, that, that showed, you know, great accomplishments. And for me, that kind of set the tone. That, that solidified my identity it was going to be based on performance and how many ribbons and trophies, and that's how our family operated. And so if you wanted to be somebody, you better be performing. So that set the tone. I grew up kind of an overweight young kid, and to have that kind of pressure and also the, you know, when you kind of grew up getting beat up, getting picked on, uh, you're really searching. You really have a kind of a wounded heart, and you're trying to do anything to try to fit in. Literally try to fit in my jeans. I try to do anything, but uh, I, but over time I started thinning out. I started to you know be successful, and that's how I that's how I got my reward. That's how I felt significant. You know, and it wasn't this performance based thing. It even applied to how I grew up spiritually. I grew up thinking about God as kind of. I'm being judged on my performance. And whether John got accepted me or not was based on how good I was. You know, so it was kind of like, you know, am I going to make the team? I mean, it's a bad analogy, but, you know, am I going to be good enough? And, and when I went to church, they talked about God, they talked about heaven, they talked about hell. And all I know, hell is not a good place. You don't want to go there. Heaven, you want to get there. And the only way to get there was to be a good person, to do the good things. Well, at life, growing up, I wasn't the most well-behaved kid, let's just say that. And uh, there are times when I, uh, at the end of the day, you know, I'd be thinking about my day, and I'd be in the framework of heaven and hell. And i think, was I good enough today? If God, if, if my life ended right now, and I stood before God, had I done enough good things? Maybe on some of those days, I wasn't so sure. I probably thought I was going to hell. And quite frankly, it scared the hell out of me. I mean, I would sit in my room and literally shudder. And after a while, though, I just started to block that out. I didn't want to think about that anymore. And I just turned my attention towards accomplishments and sports. And that type of drive, it, 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 it carried me through. And through high school, I had some success in sports. I, I went on, and, and um, uh, when I was 12 years old, I, I was in football, basketball, wrestling, baseball, and track in middle school. And then, uh, but the one thing that always was kind of intrigued me was this idea of being in the Olympics. Even from like 12 years old, I thought, that's my goal. My buddies wanted to maybe play baseball professionally or go to college, play football. I wanted to, to go to track ball. Our family is not the most petite group of people. So we're not sprinters, we're not distance runners, we're certainly not pole vaulters or high jumpers. Gravity really weighs heavy on us. So gravity has a big factor. But we can throw heavy stuff. We threw, so we, uh, my whole family, that my brothers uh, were into the weights. And so that's what I did naturally. I was a shot and discus thrower. But at 12 years old, that's what I wanted to do. So. Um, I went on, left, got done with high school, I went on to Hamlin University in St. Paul, walked on, uh, was there for about a year, but I realized I needed to get to a higher level. So then I walked on uh, to the University of Minnesota. And during that time, I had some interesting interactions, let's just say, with this idea of religion and being a Christian. I went to actually a, a Fellowship of Christian Athletes college retreat when I was a freshman. And one thing that they mentioned to me was, and they're talking about was this idea of heaven and hell. And they kind of said to me, well, if you say this prayer, this kind of magical prayer, and you say that, you're gonna, you can go to heaven. And where I was at that point was, that seems like a pretty good deal. And, and, but how I thought about it was this, is that 
I'm going to take this commitment. I'm going to I'm going to go up and say a prayer. It's kind of a it's almost like a past goal. It kind of just gets me into heaven. And then it's almost like an insurance policy. Anybody sell insurance in here? Do you have, do you have hell insurance? No, right? But that's what I thought I had. I thought I had like this fire insurance in my backyard pocket, if you know what I mean. And so I thought I just had this past go. And so that's what I stuck back there. But my life never changed. I didn't really understand what it meant to follow Jesus. And so really, my heart wasn't into it. I was still focused on me and, 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 what, and accomplishing great things. And so, and that, tell you what, when you're good at sports, and you're in an environment like the University of Minnesota, it works for a while. I mean, uh, this culture for men is really, our young men are getting hammered, and I think we have been too. We've been sold the bill of goods. Man, we've been sold the bill of goods by our culture. Our culture says if you're a man, to be a man is defined by three things. Number one, first of all, first and foremost, as a young person, be a great athlete. The stronger, faster survive. They dominate. They dominate on the playgrounds, and they dominate on the field and on the courts. Right? So if you haven't quite matured at that point, or that's not how God made you, you are less than. The athletes rule the roost. Right? So first of all, you try to be a great athlete. Second, as you got a little older, it was pursuing women. And you pursued them <laughs> at a win at all cost culture. You pursue them like a trophy. You know, they're there just to validate your manhood. You're just using them to make yourself feel better. And a third level that you reach eventually is, is success, prestige, power, and money. And for a young man like myself going into college, in sports, was, it was that in spades. It was all of those things. Because that was even the measure in sports. And so as I got to be a young man in college, man, I, I pursued all three of those areas. And again, it worked for a while. But God has a way. And, and by the way, when I was a kid, I was pro-God. I believed in God. And so that wasn't a problem. But here's the problem. I wanna, I'm going to just say this. This is a scriptural truth. The Bible says that even the demons believe in God. Think about that. Satan believes in God. I think they have a better reality and concept of God than we do. Okay, just keep that in the back of your mind. So knowing God or I believe in God, you know, that might, that's good. But is that really where it's at? Is that really what's important? So, um, and is that the defining truth that you need to hold on to? I think there's more. And I discovered that. As I got older and I started competing, I had a lot of success. I was a national champion uh, at the University of Minnesota. And, and things were going great. And my first opportunity to make an Olympic team was 1988. And just to let you know, in order to make an Olympic team in track and field, you have to first try out at what's called the Olympic trials. And it happens a month and a half, two months before the, the games themselves. So you are ranked on your best performance. So throughout the year, uh, shot putters from all over the country, they're performing. And their best performance throughout the year is ranked. And the top 24 actually get invited to the trials. Once you're there, you have a qualifying round. You get three throws. They eliminate the field to the top 12. Those top 12, all those throws that they took, those first three throws, they're eliminated. They go down to the semifinal round. They throw the prelims, they call it. They throw three throws. They rank you on those best three. The top nine get an additional three throws. So you're ranked your best throw out of your six, and they rank you, and the top three make the Olympic team. The rest of you go bye-bye. Okay? Up to that point, I'm 25 years old. I'm, 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 I'm at the strongest I had ever been and ever will be in my life. I'm 25 years old. I could 360 dunk off, I could 360 dunk a shot put. I could, I was just in the best shape of my life. Everything was going great. And at three weeks before the Olympic trials, I hit 70 feet in practice. Now, just to let you know, it's a 16 pound shot put. So for you to relate to that, think about going to the bowling alley. And now take the heaviest ball, ball in the bowling alley, which is 16 pound ball, and instead of rolling it to the pins, you're gonna stay at the foul line 
So what, what's the distance from the fall line to the pins? 60 feet, right. Throw it about 10 feet past it. So next time you go down to the Chippewa Falls lanes, you know, give a shot and see what happens. <laughs> Tell them Keith uh, will cover the damage. <laughs> so I am throwing that thing about 70 feet practice. Now for my um, training, I usually threw about three feet further in meets. So I'm, I'm looking at about 73 feet, which would have been a world record at the time. And everything was great, and if you know anything about sports, you start to taper. So I was tapering, I was taking easy throws in practice, and uh, two weeks before the trials in 88, in a practice, I tore a, or strained an adductor muscle. I was a spinner, so I used my right leg, I really whipped that thing, and I couldn't support my weight without a lot of pain in the middle. And so at that point, you know, I couldn't practice for those next two weeks. You know, I wasn't screwing around, I, didn't, I wasn't playing basketball or messing around again. I was working out and I was doing the right thing. That's what drove me nuts, you know. I was really disciplined, but I got hurt. And so the next two weeks, here's what happens though. When something like that happens, um, it starts to do something to your psyche. And what happens is, things that you have worked on all year and your confidence that you had kind of starts to erode a little bit. And what I want you to do is, that can happen in our life too. We're not guaranteed an easy life, even as a Christian, right? Things can happen. But what's important is, where have you put your faith into? What is the foundation of your life? If it's based on performance and worldly accomplishments, that goes well until it doesn't. If it's on possession, that goes well until something happens where you lose it. And I want you to listen to this story, and I want you to think if you can relate to this. It's from the book of Matthew. It talks about two builders. And so I want you to think about this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus is saying this, and acts on them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And it fell, and, it was a great, and great was its fall. So for me, that foundation started to crumble. And I didn't have a lot of confidence going in, but my, my leg had healed up enough, so I went down to uh, Indianapolis, uh, and, and I was gonna go to the Olympic trials, and I, I, I made it through the qualifying round, right? And I got to the prelims, and I had a pretty good throw. I threw 67 feet, eight inches in the prelims. And I was in third place, so I moved up, man. I, I was doing well, so I moved to the final round. So fourth round goes by, I'm still in third place. The fifth round goes by, I'm still in third place. So if I can just get through one more round, I will be on the Olympic team, I'll be able to heal completely, and I'll be able to go soul, and I'm gonna rock it there, because I, I'm, I'm so ready. On his last and final throw, this guy, Jim Doring, fell down in prelims, threw one out of bounds, barely made it into the finals through 67 feet eight and one quarter inch. So I was eliminated, I lost by a centimeter. And by the way, I don't want any of you characters coming up to me and saying, you mean you couldn't throw a half an inch further? <laughs> someone, someone actually said that to me once, so they're lucky I was a Christian. So anyway, um, so, uh, so here's what's interesting. I'm sitting there after the track meet is over, and uh, I didn't know I didn't know how to feel. So I went back to my hotel room, and, and I was dating a girl at the time, and I I kind of thought, you know, man, I might get a little sympathy here. I might get a little understanding. First thing she said to me was, "What is wrong with you? Uh, what are you talking about?" She goes, "You have been talking about making an Olympic team, and, and you've been boasting on this. You know, you're the big thrower guy, right? You're going to go to the Olympics and do all this stuff." And you just missed the team, and, and you didn't get mad, you didn't, you didn't swear, although I did that a lot too, you didn't cry, I mean, you didn't throw stuff, at least not very far, and, <laughs> and you looked like you didn't even care. 
And literally after I slammed the door in her face, because this is at the door, I was met with that. I, I, I turned around and I walked out and, and when I think about it, it's not that I didn't care. What she saw and misunderstood is that I, I didn't feel anything. Oh, you know, I felt empty. You see, this is what the world offers us, empty promises. And I don't know where you, any of you are at right now, but, but there's a point, and it happens to everybody if you're honest, you just feel disconnected. You feel like there's something missing and you feel empty. And I, I felt that in spades that day. Well, that, some people would say, you know, I remember I, the, the title of the talk was My Best Day Ever in Track and Field. I have accomplished a lot of things, but that was my best day in track and field. And the reason it was is God used that in my life to show me my emptiness, to really uh, humble me to the point to realize that, that I need something else in my life. I needed something else. But being a shot putter, it took me about four more years to figure it out. But at 25 years old, I pursued this goal. I wasn't going to give up. So I trained for another four years. And, you know, again, try accomplishing good things, highly ranked. But then something happened. And, and for me growing up as, as a kid who was like, if I just be a better person, and that was kind of the, the thing for me from a, from a God perspective, if I just be a better person. Well, I tried, guys. I tried to be a better person. It didn't work out. I failed. Sometimes I still fail. But over time, I just started to realize I can't do this on my own. And eventually, in 1992, it's my chance to try out for the next Olympics. Remember, I got to wait four years. So I get to try out again, and uh, something happened. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to embellish on it. But something happened in my life. I, it was my own doing. It was very tragic. And God just woke me up. He started going, what are you doing? You got no peace in your life. You got no, you got nothing besides yourself. And uh, a friend of mine asked me to go to church. Again, I was pro-God. And I started to go to church, and, and this church really started to give me a different message about who God was. It wasn't just this, this guy sitting up there with a big hammer and either you're good enough or, or you know, trying to judge me whether I was good enough. He was a, a God of love and grace and mercy. And it was interesting because leading up to the Olympic trials, of probably a month out, I started to really sense that God was speaking to me, that I needed to, to make a change. Because I remember this girl that I went with to church, the first question she asked me when we went out to dinner, she said, are you a Christian? I said, I think so. I said, I don't really know. But I think there's a good person inside me waiting to get out. You know, if that's your answer, if you don't know, and, and I'm not trying to be harsh, but you're probably not. Because when you're a believer and you have given and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He will change you. You will have a sense of different desires, different wants. You will know that you know. You may not be able to explain it, but you're different. And, and here's what happened to me. is I, About two weeks before the Olympic trials, uh, we went to church. And the pastor was explaining what this idea was and what it meant to be a Christian. And he said in the audience, if, and this is a small church, about 1,500 people, and, uh, and he said, if there's anybody who'd like to put their faith and trust in Christ, I want you to raise your hand. I tell you what, guys, it was like God was speaking right to me. And, uh, and there was something about that day. I, I raised my hand. And he looked around and he goes, thank you for that hand. And he said, now stand up. It kind of startled me, but you know, coach says stand up, so I stood up. And so, and he goes, now, now go to the aisle, and now come to the front. So I went down in the front, I was the only one. And he led me in a simple prayer. Remember, it wasn't a, it was probably the same prayer, but the prayer was the same, the gospel is the same, but I was different. God had really showed me that I needed him, and I was humbled at that point. You know, that's why I said it was my best day ever in track and field. And I went forward, and the Bible says that if you, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, the problem here is, why do I need to be saved? I'm a good guy. You know, I, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. 
The problem with that is that the Bible said all Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. That means separation from God. God is a holy God. He's a just God. And the thing about that is we deserve punishment. But then Jesus. You know, that's why God sent Jesus. He sent Jesus, who is God, to this earth to die on the cross, to pay the penalty that we deserve. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we, He gives that to us. He pays the price for our sins. He takes on that penalty. And the best way I can describe it is this, and I'll, and I'll be closing here in a minute. Imagine you're in a court of law, every one of you. And your spouse or child was murdered. And it was done in broad daylight in front of witnesses. There's even camera footage. This dog is guilty. There, he was pronounced guilty in a trial. Now it's sentencing. And you're there to witness the sentencing. And the judge says, okay, sir, do you have any last words, any final words before I sentence you? It's a death penalty state, by the way. And the guy says, judge, I am so sorry. I'm sincerely, sincerely sorry that I did that. It was a mistake. And the judge goes, I believe you. You know, you seem like a good guy. You know something? I'm going to let you go. And, and he says, okay, you're free to go. How would you feel? Oh, isn't he a loving judge? What a, what a loving thing to do. Just to let that guy walk. No. Where is justice? Justice might, must, be, must happen for this to be right. It's not right. Okay? Now we're going to flip it. You're the murderer. You're the one that made the mistake. You're the one that's on trial. You're the one that's guilty. And it's sentencing time. And you're heading for the chair. And the judge says, do you have any last words? And you plead your case. Oh, merciful judge, have mercy on me. I am so sorry. And the judge looks at you and goes, I believe you, but I don't have the authority to let you go. You have to go. Justice has to be served. Someone's got to pay the price for your crimes. And you are being led out in shackles. And just before you get to the door with the bailiff, you hear a voice that says, stop, bring him back. And you notice the judge's voice, and you turn around, and you expect to see him on the, up in the judge chair. But no, he's standing down on the floor. And he's standing there, and he goes, bring him to me. And when you get to him, the judge holds out his hands, and he says to the bailiff, put his cuffs on me. I'm going to take it for him. I'm going to go to the chair, because that's the only way that this can work. And you see, that's what Jesus did for us. He is, he is the judge. And he's totally just, and he's totally fair, but he also loves us. So the only way he could work it out was that he paid the price for us. And so when he came down, he took on the form of a man so that he could die on the cross. And God can do this because he has the authority, because he's the judge. He, you know, like, how does that all work? It works because it's God. And it works because Jesus is God, and he took it for us. And, and, and John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he says, only one of the God's son that who may ever believe in him uh, shall be saved and not perish. I want to also say one more scripture before I finish the story here. And this is really important. Some of us have a hard time with this idea of, that's it? Can I really be forgiven? I mean, I got to do something. I, you know, no, God can't forgive me. You know, how does this all work? And I love Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says this, it said, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not a result of works, so that anyone, no one can boast. It's a gift, guys. And it's by putting your faith in Christ. See, when I went forward that day, and I gave my life to Christ, everything changed. Because God, when, when you put your faith, you repent, which means you turn away. He said, I, I was, in 19... Uh, um, 81, or when I went to that FCA college retreat, I wasn't really repenting. I just wanted fire insurance. 
I wasn't willing to give up my lifestyle. So my heart wasn't right. 1992, uh, I was ready. And my heart was right. So um, I was ready to accept that free gift. But I was also ready to put my faith and trust in Christ and repent and do things His way and put Him number one in my life. So what happened was, is two weeks later, I go to the Olympic trials. And on my first throw, I threw 60... Uh, eight feet, one and three quarters inches. Not a bad throw, I'm in first. I go through the third round, still in first. Fourth round, a uh, guy by the name of Mike Stoltz passed me up. I go to the um, second place now, which is good. I go to the fifth round, I'm in second place, and I go to the sixth round, and a guy by the name of Jim Doring, on his last throw, through 68, one and like 68, four, passed me up. I hate that guy. So he passed me up. <laughs> But the good news was I went from second to third, and the competition ended, and I made the Olympic team, and I went to Barcelona, Spain, and competed. And you see, the difference was, people might say, Ron, did you make the team because you were born again? No, I made the team because I worked my off, okay, for years and years and years. But the difference, again, is the fact that I wasn't going there to glorify myself. It wasn't about me. It was, it was almost like a, a thanksgiving of what God had done in my life. I went there to compete, but I was doing it for God's glory. And God totally changed me. Now, I only got 10th, and it was a disappointment. 88, I was devastated. I was totally flat out. 92, I realized, okay, I didn't accomplish my goal of getting a medal, but I have God in my life, and nothing will ever take that away. And gentlemen, what I want to do for you today is give you an opportunity. If, like, I remember, you know, sitting in that pew, how it felt like God was just calling me. And just like, I needed to make that step. Okay, it wasn't like, I just sensed it, okay? Now some of you, you might be feeling that right now. You might be going, I'm not sure, I wanna be sure. I'm tired of doing this on my own. I am empty. Some of you might be going, hey, I, I made my commitment to Christ and I'm saying amen to that. Some of you might be going, eh, not for me. Chicken was good, beans were overcooked, and I'm ready to get out of here. And that's fine, so I'm just gonna ask you to be a little, a little patient. But here's what I'm going to do. For those of you who really feel a sense that God wants you to take that next step of faith, what I want to do is lead you in a simple prayer. Now, it's not a magical prayer. Because it's not magic. It's, an, it's, it's, it's a cry of your heart. That you want to make that next step in your faith journey and solidify your relationship with God. And yes, be assured that you're going to heaven. But more importantly, be assured that now you have a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to, in just a second, I'll give you some quick instructions. I'm going to have you close your eyes, bow your head. I'm going to say a very simple prayer, and I, if that's your commitment, I want you to just repeat it. Actually, I want you to audibly repeat it after me. I'll go slow enough where even a shot putter can do it. So... Um, and it's important that you confess this out loud because Jesus said, if you will not confess me before men, I will not confess you to the Father. It's an important step. It solidifies your decision. You can know that on March 8th, 9th, or 2018, I made that decision. So let's, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And when we're done, and I'm done with the prayer, I just ask you to keep your heads down, your eyes closed, and I'm just going to have you look up at me and uh, if you made it, I'm going to ask you if anyone made that first time commitment to look up at me. And then I'm just going to acknowledge you by saying thank you. Because I, I want to I I I acknowledge that you made that step. So close your eyes, bow your heads. And just take a minute and just we'll repeat after me. If this is your prayer, if you either want to recommit your life or you want to give your life to Christ and, and, and call it a done deal, uh, just repeat after me. Heavenly Father. I love you. I thank you so much for, for showing up today in my life. I, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And uh, Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sins. I repent and I turn away from that life. And I commit this day and trust in you alone, Jesus. Jesus, fill me with your spirit today. 
Heal me, Lord. And I commit to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you keep your eyes closed and head down, I want you to know, if you've made this commitment for the first time, I just want you to slip your hand up, look at me, I just want to acknowledge you. If you made this commitment for the first time, just look at me, thanks. Thank you, don't get it wrong, thanks. Anyone else? Raise your hand, please, so I know. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you back there. If I didn't get you, I'm going to get you. So anyone else? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you over there. Anyone else? Raise your hand up. Am I missing anybody? Thank you back there. All right, I'm going to close in prayer. Now, if, if you made that commitment and you didn't quite get it, don't worry about it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for just, I mean, I'm just a shop putter guy. It's your words, it's your spirit, it's you, Lord Jesus, that saves us. I thank you right now for these souls who maybe don't get it all, but they know that you're calling them and they put their faith and trust in you. I pray right now you reveal yourself to them in, in, in significant ways. And Lord, I also pray that you bring people in their life that can help them to walk this out and to really learn what it means to be a Christian and to grow and to experience and to receive all the blessings that you have for us. You know, <clears throat> the Bible says that when one sinner repents, all the angels in heaven rejoice. And I know there's a party going on in heaven, Lord. And I just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. One last thing. If you have made this commitment, I want you on this card. When you filled it out, grab it. Just put a neck, put a cross next to the lion. Now here's why. You're not signing up for a encyclopedias or you're getting a subscription to Leading with Power magazine. What you're signing up for is an opportunity for Leading with Power to connect with you and just, just be with you and, and to walk this journey with you if that's what you want. Tell you what, you cannot do this alone. Don't be so, hey, your stubbornness may have delayed you coming to Christ to this point. Don't continue to be stubborn and think you can do this by yourself. I couldn't make the Olympics by myself. I needed a coach. I needed several coaches. I needed support staff. You need to build a team around you to help you grow. Because it's something to learn and to grow in. You are a Christian. You are. That will never change. But do you want to still be a, you want to be a baby Christian your whole life, or do you want to grow and mature and experience all that God has for you? It takes a little work, but you know anything in life worth it takes a little work. But you will enjoy it, and you will you can journey with some phenomenal people. So I just want to encourage you to put that cross on that card, and Keith and, and this band of cohorts will reach out to you. So thank you so much. If you have any questions or whatever, I'll hang out for a while.